let me introduce our guest. James Leisenring earned his undergraduate degree at Albion College and his MBA at Western Michigan, where he actually taught for several years. Uh, by the way, I should say, I'm going to give you a few bullet points. If you spend any time with Jim Leisenring, you will have a lot of flesh put on the bones of, this, of these bullet points. I mean, his stories are outstanding. He is, let me just say at the outset, he is the consummate, and I hope this doesn't offend you or embarrass you, he is the consummate standard setter on both the national and international levels. Um, I, I'm not sure there's another person that's touched as many accounting standards um, internationally and nationally as you have, Jim. And you, you can contradict me if you'd like when you get up here, but, but I see him as the consummate standard setter. And you'll get a sense of that from just these bullet points. So he joined the staff of the F FASB in 1982 as director of research and technical activities and became chairman of the Emerging Issues Task Force in 1984 when that, when that committee was begun. He was appointed a member of the FASB, the actual board, in 1987 and appointed vice chairman in 1988, where he served until 2000. In 2001, Mr. Leisenring was appointed a member of the International Accounting Standards Board and was appointed its liaison back to the FASB. When he completed his service on the International Accounting Standards Board in 2010, he was appointed senior advisor to the FASB, where he's currently serving. And uh, I suggest you ask him at some point what he does as senior advisor to the FASB. I, I uh, enjoyed that story earlier today. Let me give you just a, a little snapshot of the kinds of activities he's been involved in as a member of the FASB and the ISB. So during his time at the FASB, he served as chairman of the Derivatives Implementation Group and the Financial Instruments Task Force. He was also a member of the International Joint Working Group on Financial Instruments, and more recently served as the FASB's Director of International Activities. Uh, Jim Leisenring, it's a pleasure to have you back. It's an honor to have you back here. He's actually, I think, the only person who has been our Hilton Lecture two times in its 30-year existence. So, Mr. Leisenring. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to make the uh, disclaimer down here, and I have to say it out loud because they print it so damn small you couldn't read it if you had to, and I'm supposed to make clear that my views are my views, they're not the FASB's views, certainly not the ISB's views anymore. They're, you know, you know the, you know the routine. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the international convergence process. Uh, it's kind of come to its conclusion and we'll talk about how successful and unsuccessful that's been. Talk about why it's had its successes, although those are harder to identify than its lack of success, so we'll spend more time there. And you can ask me questions. If you have a burning question, raise your hand. Somebody will get you a mic, and we'll hopefully have some time at the end. Uh, Mr. Professor Hilton and I have something in common. Made me think of that when you were talking about how tough he was. About the third year I was teaching at Western Michigan, the dean called, called me down to his office. I don't think the man had ever spoken to me before, you know? And I, I did know who he was. I didn't know he knew who I was. And I trotted down to the dean's office, and he told me that something I didn't know, but that the dean's office, university-wide, kept grade point averages of professors, much like a student has A, B, C, D. And he congratulated me on having the second lowest grade point average of any faculty member on the whole campus. And it was a graduate professor in physics that had a lower one than me. And I thought, I don't think this is really a positive statement this man's making at any rate. So um, Mr. Hilton and I may have something in common. All right. The vision, obviously, initially for, for international convergence and the, what the spin doctors said, it, particularly the ISB but also the FASB, that the vision was one single set of high quality global standards. Well, what, hell, would you expect them to say low quality? I mean, you know, one set of low quality global standards or just one set of standards used on the global capital markets? Well, you're not going to say ignored. On the cap. So this is all cool, right? You can't possibly disagree with high quality and being used. Now the problem is that I don't think, and we'll explore this, whether we can reach agreement on what we mean 
by a high quality accounting standard. And I'm pretty sure we won't reach any agreement on what is meant by the word used. So we've got some problems right off the bat. Years back, about 1995 or so, the FASB had an annual conference, still do, have about 50, 60 academics are there, the SEC is there, the five or six largest accounting firms, explore various issues, drink a lot, consider it to be a big thing. And they, and they, they had this thing, a thing on what constituted a high quality accounting standard. And I wrote a paper for that conference that had the first three bullets in it. Again, the spin doctors added the fourth, which I think is redundant, but that's okay. And I said that, they, that to be a high quality standard had to be consistent with a conceptual framework, had to minimize alternative accounting procedures, explicit or implicit, talk about that in a minute, because comparability and consistency enhances the utility of the information, be unambiguous and comprehensible, so that the people have to apply it, know what to do, people have to audit it, know what to do, people have to regulate, know what they're supposed to be regulating, they added the fourth, be capable of rigorous interpretation and application, which certainly is not disagreeable, but I'm not sure that isn't about the same as the third. I had forgotten I wrote this paper. It didn't have the circulation of Time Magazine or anything like that when it came out. Uh, but I didn't even have forgotten about it until we had the FASB picked it up and put it in their vision statement involving international standards. And, 1999. Somebody pointed that out to me here about a year ago, and I didn't even know it was in there. Okay, but I think these are good, good starting point at least, and I think you can see that each of those attributes of high quality, as I suggested them, tend to promote comparability. Application of standards leads to consistent conclusions across varieties of transactions. In other words, the same economic phenomena whether it's labeled A or labeled B, tends to get the same answer. That explicit alternatives are not comparable, and both IASB and FASB standards certainly have some explicit alternatives, as you're aware. But more importantly to me is that implicit alternatives that are the result of ambiguity and an inability to imply and interpret consistently consistently are far more dangerous than explicit alternatives. The user community can do a pretty good job of you disclosing that I'm on LIFO, I'm on FIFO, I use method A, you use method B. We even sometimes make you tell, the dif tell people the difference. The dangerous problems are accounting standards where the variety of application is anywhere from here to here and no user has a clue where you are on that spectrum. Whether you're over here, 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 and narrowing it down, that's the dangerous one. That's the true non-comparability because it's non-comparability you're ignorant of as a user, an investor, and a resource provider. Boards have agreed with that. The two boards and the concept statements they recently released in 2010 said one of the most important reasons for reporting standards are needed is to increase comparability. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. So I have just two questions for you. Are principle-based standards, are they compatible with a comparability objective? Yes or no? Do you have a clue what a principle-based standard is? Because I don't. I have, I'm clueless. I think it's just nonsense. I think what it means is a standard I like the answer to. Okay, I like this one. It's principle-based. If I don't like it, I'll probably call it rules-based. In the comment letters that I saw as an IASB board member, most of the world, at least, believes principle-based is a standard sufficiently loosey-goosey or sufficiently ambiguous that I get to do damn near anything I want. And boy, I like that principle. That's a good one, okay? And a new thing that's come into the vernacular is that I want to account for the business model. I tell you, I have no clue what that means. But let me tell you about my business model. Back when Michigan finally became a state and I got out of school, <laughs> uh, 1964, I got out of graduate school, if you can believe it. 1964, I had a business model. 
And I've accounted for it ever since. My personal financial statements. I'm an accounting nerd. I do my personal financial statements. My business model was to make $2 million a year. And I had some years I ran a little short. <laughs> and you know what? My wife pointing out to me, to me that I may be running out of time <laughs> to make up those short years. But don't worry about it. Because I got an asset on my balance sheet for $162 million. And the debit is asset needed to get income at $2 million a year. <laughs> OK? That's accounting for a business model. And if you don't think that's what people mean when they say that, you're not listening. Listen carefully. It's management choice, management intent. It's propaganda. It's not information, as my financial statements are. Um, to the ISB, what does used mean? To the ISB, it may mean something different than to us. In this country, clearly used would mean required. To them, it clearly means allowed or required. They publish their little map that's famous in all the accounting journals where they color in all the countries that you, that what they say, use IFRS. And they search the world for one guy in a country that's using it, and then they can color it in, you know? I was there. I knew what they were doing. It made us look good. But here we would think of them having to be required, not allowed, or else you're not going to get any comparability. Some, most in fact, do not adopt international accounting standards. They adapt them. That's quite different. The Chinese say they're coming close. Well, China's a big country, so I think close doesn't mean very close. We aren't talking about Liechtenstein's closeness here. We're talking about China. You know, and the Europeans, they haven't adopted yet. They say they're the first to adopt international standards. They don't adopt. They have a very, very complicated political process to decide standard by standard rather to adopt. In this country, we'd say, we've adopted FASB standards. The SEC rules say you will follow them. The only way you wouldn't have to is the SEC overrules that by their own rulemaking. The reverse is true internationally. All right? That's a quite different notion. Now, there are some countries that have unequivocally adopted. Australia sort of has. They've made them tougher in some areas. New Zealand has. South Africa has. So there's a handful that have. There's also some others that assert they've adopted. Afghanistan, you know, Uzbekistan, a few others. If you believe that they've really adopted, I'll sell you a bridge right into New York City on the way out. <laughs> and that's the real problem. Because if the application isn't consistent, all right, if the infrastructure isn't there, so that the application isn't reasonably consistent, like we think we reasonably do here, and some other countries do as well. The real question is, have we accomplished anything? Is it illusory that we're on a single set of standards without consistent application? And the SECs ask exactly the right question. It's dismaying to the ISB, but their implicit question is, hey, if we're not really going to achieve the objective, of getting comparable information with this set of standards, is the cost of conversion in the United States really worth it? Because it's hundreds of millions of dollars. It's the systems that would have to change and the like. And the United States is going to be reluctant to do that. And I think that's unsettling to the international community. But I think that's where we are today. I certainly won't live long enough, I don't think, to see a single set of international standards. And I still feel pretty good. So I think some of you might see it. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, the memorandum of of, that started the convergent process really was from the SEC in 2005. And at that time, they said, quit. Focus on major projects. There was a thing called a 20F reconciliation that every foreign registrant had to file in the United States showed the differences between US GAAP net income, foreign net income. There were dozens and dozens of things identified. And the SEC said, quit messing around with those things. Some of them don't amount to much. And 
by the way, quit trying to converge in adequate standards. You know, you can't put enough Band-Aids on leasing standards to make it effective. You really can't. You know, you just can't. So they said, quit trying. And let's identify the major projects that are deficiencies in US GAAP and international, and let's get to work on them. And we identified those projects. There was an exhaustive process in, here, domestically and internationally, identified 11 projects. One of them, neither board would add to the agenda in tangible assets, but had been identified as a fundamental weakness. But then business combinations, fair value measure, you see the list. The interesting thing is that we cheat. Because when we look at that list, we'd really done all the hard work on business combinations when we put it on the list. The FASB had already issued 141, which eliminated poolings. That was the big deal. The ISB had also done that already, too, with IFRS 3. So we just did 141R later on and so we could check it off the list. It's done. You know? Uh, fair value measurement, same thing. The ISB has successfully copied Statement 157. Congratulations. But that was essentially done when the MOU list was put together. So that was an easy one to tick off the list as well. And we, we're all guilty of this. Revenue recognition, I've got completed 2014. But it's now 2015, and we're still interpreting some things. So uh, we'll see. But I think it's done, and it will be one of your real challenges when you guys move into practice next year, the year after, because it's not effective yet, and virtually every client is saying, is what I'm doing now going to be acceptable, yes or no, under the new standard? And that's what firms are spending an enormous amount of time on as we speak. The rest of these things aren't done. We're going to talk about some of those and why. They aren't, they aren't done. Uh, in 2010, they refocused that long list because the ISB was promising people that everything on that list would be done, listen carefully, by 2011. Now, I never knew what that meant because that to me what meant December 31st, 2010 had to be done or it would be 2011. Then it switched to no, 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 that just means by the end of 2011. So that was a quick way to borrow another year. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, by 2010, they knew they weren't going to get all those done. And by the way, we kept redefining done. One of the things we, one of the things to, the way you can get things done is say, I started out, you know, to do this. I've got this much, I'm done. You know, that's what we were doing. We were redefining scopes of projects to get done, we didn't get done with them. The four are there, and we always were fretting about insurance accounting. And I, you can live a rich and rewarding life and never even think about insurance accounting. You really can. You really can. Uh, you know. In fact, I would say a richer and more rewarding life <laughs> to not ever think about insurance accounting. But you may want to, and it's high paid work, so go ahead. Um, the record of accomplishment is not stellar. That's the polite way I've been told to sell it, say it. Not the way I used to say it, but I, I'm now a junior advisor there, so I get censored. Uh, but the projects were vexatious. Come on. Those were, th those were issues we've had in standard setting since the 1930s and 40s. So it's not a surprise that we've struggled with them. And it, the effort was certainly worthwhile to have struggled. But they aren't done. And my point to you is that progress has been limited because of a lack of agreement on basic conceptual issues, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in three areas. Inconsistent application asset and liability definitions, no agreements in accounting for forward contracts or options written and held, derivatives world and the rest educated us to the fact that there's an enormous amount of optionality and forwardish things in contracts that we never thought of before, and we certainly have no agreement on measurement issues. But let's look at the ones not completed just very quickly. Leases. There's no disagreement, really, that a lease creates a liability, and there's no disagreement 
that a lease creates a right to use. I deliver, I deliver you the keys to the car. Yeah, you've got a right to use the car. Now you've got to make your payments, but that's true of your house if you buy it. You don't make your payments on your mortgage, they're going to come take your house. So you've got a right to your house, but you better pay for it. There's nothing anomalous about this, okay? We've always wanted to call it executory. I also don't know what that means. But there's executory contracts, and you'll see we still think that. But let me ask you a question. When you think of lease accounting, and you've been in a debate, you think about, well, I got a five-year lease on this building with four options to renew for five years each. We all want to say, ooh, you don't really have a five-year lease there. No, 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 no. We think you're going to lease it a lot longer than that. So the arguments, how much liability do you have? I'm the lessee. I don't have any liability for those renewals. I've got an asset. I've got a right to renew. That's a written option I hold. Why are we talking about booking liabilities for things for which I have no obligation? All right? Can the option written by the lessor create an asset? The lessor says, I think Jack's going to renew this for 50 more years. Terrific. He doesn't, have, he, he doesn't have a right to those payments. None whatsoever. He's got an obligation to deliver the property. Not a right to collect anything. Now, if he delivers, he will, but there we go, you know. Why do we think, and both boards have done this, why do we think when, every, what, Seth, every student here, what, has a BMW, Mercedes, Porsche? Okay, you're Porsche. 1,200 a month lease, 900s for your right to use the Porsche, 300s for maintenance and warranty. Why would we split the maintenance and warranty out separately from the right to use? You owe 1,200 a month. I'm taking your car back if you don't pay me 1,200. You can't pay me 900. Say I don't want the warranty and the maintenance. I say give me the car back. Okay. But people want to do that. And we want to call one of them executory and not the other. On the lessor side, the same thing. On the lessor side, they want to say, and the ISB says it in their new framework, a lessor has no performance obligation once they delivered the underlying property. That's ridiculous. Of course they do. Do you think they'll get paid for this building? 20-year lease payments if the building burns down? I don't think so. I think they have a liability to supply the building for the period of the lease. We don't want to do that. We don't like doing some of that. Okay? But if default on the contract can occur without performance, somebody must have a liability or it's silly to call it a default. The FASB's created a new one. Seth may be able to straighten them out on this. I've been unaware able to do that. But because we've gotten so used to, with operating leases to have a straight line of expense, a smooth net income, all right, what we're going to do with certain class of leases is back end the amortization. Because the early years of a lease, obviously the finance cost is high. End of the lease, the finance portion of it's low. Surprise, surprise. The more you owe, higher your interest. Wow. Good thing. Write that down. Write that down. That's important. But that means that if you straight line the right of use, my gosh, in the early years, your expense is higher than the later years. Whew, another real, real jewel. That's a gem to understand. Well, how do you fix that? Don't do any depreciation in the first year. Do it all at the end. It'll all come out straight. Nice. That's cool. Terrific. Great concept. We call it the plug. Financial instruments. I think the accounting profession, I think the standard setting world, will one day, hopefully a long ways from now, but the next credit crisis, which will come, you'll live through one. All generations do. Severity may change, but when it comes, accounting profession is going to get a big stick in their eye when people said, you mean 
the result of 2007, 8, 9 is you didn't do a damn thing to financial instrument standards? What were you doing? And we're going to say, um, um, why can't we figure out even how to impair a loan? All right? I don't un understand this. You know, and now both boards are saying that on day one when I lend, what's your name? RJ. RJ I lend RJ a million dollars. Let's cut that back, 100,000 <laughs> to RJ. It's 6%. I've got a loss that day. How could I have a loss that day? If I don't think 6% and 100,000 is going to get paid back, what the hell did I lend it to him for? Well, the theory is, well, because I loaned to a lot of people. Oh, well, that means I could have a lot of losses. All right? What they really are saying is, RJ is getting a good deal because the rest of us idiots are willing to pay 6 and we should be paying 5 so that we pay for RJ, who's not going to pay. All right? We don't allow future losses anywhere else. But we think this would be a good idea for loans. I don't have any idea why. Why can't we agree on measurement attributes for financial instrument? This is the only thing I'm going to say, OK, my opinion. We absolutely should measure every financial instrument of fair value through, through net income. If we're not willing to do that, let me tell you, you will never, never reduce the complexity in accounting for financial instruments. The multiple attributes, the bright lines between when you do what, how you do it, that's the complexity. Is it difficult to measure some things at fair value financial instruments? Sure. But the worst ones are already all at fair value, derivatives. The banks say they can't measure the fair value of a loan to me. Man, if they really believed that, I'd get into a different business if I were them. Because they already know my credit risk. Do they not know interest rates? Come on, they're bankers. Is presentation why we can't agree on these questions? Yes. It's not measurement that causes the problem. It's remeasurement. Initial measurement of things isn't controversial. But when we remeasure it, what does it produce? Gain or a loss. Where that gain or loss be? Where is it? That's the issue. And we won't resolve this as long as we think it's going to be distortive of income. And I just don't think anyone can take the, all of you have at least had statement 115, which, by the way, I voted for. One of the dumb things, many dumb ones I voted for. 115, if you think that produces sensible information, you're smoking dope. I mean, you, you, you really can't take a, a treasury bill and say, well, some of these three I'm trading, not those four, because those I might trade. And those two over there, I will never, never trade unless I trade them. <laughs> All right, that's what we're doing now, right? Is that what we're doing, 115? That uh, makes a lot of sense. That's real comparable information. Consolidations. Some of you may not have had it yet, everybody's just having it now. But what do we mean by control of another entity? The, I, it, it, the ISB just says you control it if you control it. And you have to reach that decision. Are you or aren't you in control? I don't really think there's another solution but that. The FASB thinks, well, you control it if you own 50.1% of the stock. Do you not understand that in any company with any wide dispersion of shareholders, the difference between 49.9 and 50.1 has nothing to do with economics. It's just on the point where you can manipulate. Now, if you really think control means perpetuation of control, then you need 50.1. You do, because you could lose control. But rather, you're in control with probably 30 or 35 most big public companies. You have 30% of a block of General Motors. I guarantee you, they're not going to hang up on you. OK? They will not hang up on you. And we're going to get into a principle called stickiness in a minute. And we'll figure out what we do with stickiness. But applying it to business combinations, it would indeed be truly strange. Derecognition. This is the worst issue I've ever had to face. And 
accounting. I think it, it is our most perplexing issue. It's not recognition, it's derecognition. And by the way, it's one of the few times we've invented a word because if you Google derecognition, I'm sorry, not Google, just type it, spell check goes every time you do it, you know, because it's not a word. But when do you take an asset of liability off your balance sheet? Why don't, we, this would be a great idea. Why not take it off if it's no longer an asset or a liability? Ooh, wow. Isn't that a big one? Huh? We don't do that. Why? Because we want to confuse risks and rewards with assets and liabilities. Risks and rewards are not. We'll talk about that in a minute. What do we do with options or forward contracts? If I own 40% of the stock in a company and an option to get 20% more, am I in control or aren't I? If ISB says yes, FASB says no. Another example of options forwards not being consistently done. And now we're back to stickiness. Stickiness means path dependency. And that I get a different answer depending on whether I once owned something. If I own a billion dollars worth of receivables and I sell them to Zachary, all right, for a billion dollars. But I, to, to get a billion dollars from Zachary, I guarantee that the principal payments will be paid. All right? I guarantee the principal payments will be paid. And I say, all right, I'll guarantee these up to 2% credit loss. And we both agree that the real exposure in this portfolio is 1.5%. So he's really well over guaranteed. All right? We want to say, oh, you didn't sell those. You didn't sell those. You've still got them. So what's the journal entries? If I didn't credit receivables when I sold, Zachary, sold them to Zachary, I got a debit to cash for a billion. I did half this entry. You do the other half. Where does the other half go? If it can't go to receivables, it goes to liability. So what's the consequence of that transaction? I still have a billion dollars worth of receivables on my books, and I have no right to collect anything. Is that good accounting? I wouldn't think so. I also have a liability on my books for a billion dollars that I wouldn't know who to pay if I wanted to write a check. Okay? My maximum liability could only be 2% of the billion. But we want to say because you owned it once, you still own it. Because you've retained some risks and rewards. Uh, liability equity definition. Another portion of the literature you don't want to read if you can avoid it, but you will not be able to avoid it. I think it's unfathomable to get through the FASB's literature on liability and equity distinction. It is so complicated, so complicated. And the complication rests on the fact that our definition of liability is that I have to be able to be obligated to deliver an asset of mine, an asset of the entity. So then we get nervous, because what if I say to you four suppliers here, I'm a Silicon Valley startup, and I don't have cash. So I reserve the right to take my accounts payable, which are going to run a million a month to each of you, and I won't pay cash, maybe, unless I have some, if I have some, I will. If I don't have any cash, I will give, I reserve the right to deliver shares equal to what I owe you. And we can put in transaction costs. You're whole, you're whole harmless. Same as getting a check. The present definition says my account's payable is equity. Right? Because I have no obligation to deliver an asset. I have an obligation to deliver something that you would call an asset but not me. It's not my asset. So we don't know, we get messed up there. And then we want to make a distinction between fixed and variable shares, because that would be variable shares. We want to call that a liability, even though I don't have an obligation to deliver an asset. Okay? Gains and losses, why do we not put them in comprehensive income? I don't know. 
Why do we diff, do account for options and forwards on your own stock, different than any other option or forward? I don't know. We're all back to the same reason that project's not done. Retirement benefits. Does an unvested pension obligation meet the definition of a liability? You haven't retired, who, who I'm not going to pay you. You got a future service for I'm going to pay you. Does that meet the definition of a liability or not? Pension standard says it must, right? We're accruing it. Why do we do that? Smooth it, or are we making up a new definition of liability? Which are we doing? Does the pr projected benefit obligation require future salary, future service? Does that meet the definition of a present obligation? Seems difficult to figure out how. What do we mean by a constructive obligation? I have no idea. And why does a funded post-retirement plan, normal pension plans, why don't we just call those SPEs, right? Special purpose entities and consolidate them. Why do we do all this netting and messing around and amortizing gains and losses by the square root of your shoe size? All those things are in there. Why are they in there? Smoothing, I think. <sighs> Financial statement presentation. Why don't we just require a single statement of comprehensive income? Because we can't agree to do that. Page breaks, an accounting principle. OK? Get it on two pages, ooh, that's good. Put it on one page, oh, everybody will be confused if it's on one page, OK? And if we think a subtotal of net income within comprehensive income is so damn important, why don't we take the time to define it? There's no definition of it anywhere. No requirement to present it even. But we sure think it's important. Absolutely important. The whole, it's the linchpin of accounting, undefined. I actually think that our failure to, rep, to resolve presentation issues over gains and losses is why we don't resolve the debt equity question, why we don't do options and forwards right, why we won't settle measurement issues. So this may be more important than anything else, but we're having trouble getting anywhere. This is what we teach at the FASB. Seth's going to get bored with this. Every time he writes a memo, doesn't do this, somebody's going to yell at him. Actually, nowadays, they just go see lies and rings so he can yell at you. You have to ask the right questions. Not only do you have to ask the right questions, you have to ask them in the right order. What's the asset? What's the liability? Does the asset allow, does it change? If it changes, is it a result of investment buyer distribution to an owner? If it isn't, it's got to be revenue, expense, gain, or loss. Figure out which it is. Do it in that order, you'll always be right. Try and start down at the bottom, you'll never be right. You'll never be right. You can't just say, what's your revenue? Well, revenue is just something we make up. You got to say, what's the asset? Did it change? What's the liability? Did it change? You got to do it in that order. Um, here's the definition of assets. Served us extraordinarily well. There's only four things wrong with it. The word probable, the phrase future economic benefits, the word control, and the phrase past transactions or events. Other than that, it's pretty solid. Pretty solid, okay? Now, what I say, there's problems. They're, they're, not, they're not serious problems. They're nuanced problems. What's wrong with it is probable. You go read that footnote. Do you know that it says it has nothing to do with the probability of occurrence? Well, then what the hell does it mean? What would probable mean if it didn't mean that? Okay, whatever. Future economic benefits, you see in a second, that's the wrong emphasis. Assets are present benefits, not future benefits. Bene I like assets now, okay? I, I'm comfortable having them now. Control, trouble with what we mean by that. And the phrase past transaction or event is obviously just redundant. Because if you got an asset, something had to happen. How'd you get it? Some event or transaction had to happen or you wouldn't have it. So we don't need that. We love symmetry in accounting, so liabilities is similarly messed up. Liabilities are probable future sacrifice of economic. I think liabilities are present obligations. 
all right? Probable has the same spooky definition. Future economic benefits is emphasized in the wrong place. We have uncertainties as to obligations. We're not going to talk about that today, but there are some things you don't know whether you're liable for. Litigation, you know, lots of things have happened. If you're a trucking company, you don't know that perish the thought while we were speaking, you ran a truck off the road and killed a bunch of people. You just don't have a way of knowing some things. You usually know when you get assets, but you don't. Not the same with liability, so we have some special problems. And the past transaction or events phrase is, again, redundant. Revenues, inflows, or enhancements of assets, we know that. Or settlements of liabilities. And then we distinguish revenue from gains and losses down below. Expenses, similarly done. But guess what people do with that collection of four definitions? They get very, very nervous. Because the basic conclusion of that is that assets and liabilities have conceptual primacy. As Oscar Galeen, who's a Deloitte partner, deceased now, if you see Galeen's name on an old accounting article, read it. It will be insightful. It will be way ahead of its time today, and he's been dead for 20 years. He's that good, always was that good. Smartest man I ever met in accounting. Wonderful board member when he was on. But the, this conclusion about primacy is the most misunderstood, misrepresented thing in the conceptual framework that we have at either board. And I'll show you the two misrepresentations. The first is that the board's adopted a balance sheet approach. One of the people I met with today said that. I resisted saying, Barrr! you know. Uh, but he said it, OK? I don't even know what that means. Pacioli told us we had double entry bookkeeping. We can't have one without the other. All right? You just can't. It's ax axiomatic. And you cannot, all the board really said is, that you, they didn't adopt that approach. They said that things that fail the definitions of assets and liabilities should not be on balance sheets. My debit to get my business model doesn't belong there. We're not going to say total assets and numbers to get income where we want it, or li to liabilities and numbers to get income where we want it, because the other side of every one of those things is income. You learned that in elementary accounting. Second, a whole class of people, particularly in the academic community, want to write articles that say the framework requires fair value. I wish the hell it did. I'm in favor of fair value. Be a huge improvement. Operational problems with property, plant, and equipment, inventory, I understand that. I'd rather fight those than where we are. That's just personal opinion, doesn't matter. But it's not true. The framework's totally deficient in dealing with measurement. We have not done anything of the kind. Where should the focus on assets and liabilities be? Just jiggle the words around a little bit. Assets have got to be present rights. It either exists or it doesn't exist. All right? Not the probable future benefit. The probable future benefit's the result of having an asset. It's not the asset. All right? What's your name? Al? No. Al? If, you, if I owe you a million dollars, the flow to you is the result of me owing you the million. The million's your right. And you can't make it happen. You can try to make me pay, unless you're in New Jersey, maybe you could. Uh, they, they have different collection methods. But most places, <laughs> most places, you cannot make it happen. You just have the right. And contingent asset, we're retarding generations of students by even using the word. It's an oxymoronic expression. If it's contingent that you have a right, it ain't an asset. OK? It just isn't. And again, symmetry seems to work on both sides of the equation. Same things can be said about liability. Liabilities are present obligations. The flow that results from being obligated can, in fact, even be zero. Because if I guarantee those receivables that you 
went to somebody that I bought, I have a liability for the guarantee, but I don't expect to have an outflow. In fact, you wouldn't want to pay your insurance premiums if every insurance contract they expected they'd have to pay. You wouldn't like the premiums, I can assure you. All right? Again, get contingent liability out of your vocabulary. What we're talking about is assets and liabilities with uncertain outcomes. That's what we ought to be talking about. Not whether the liability might occur or the asset might occur. Those aren't assets and liabilities. Virtually certain in and outbound cash flows, those aren't li assets and liabilities. General Motors is going to have sales next year. 250 billion probably of inbound cash flow. They have an asset now? I don't think so. They're going to pay late wages next year? I think so. Do they have a liability for them now? I don't think so. Dead flat certain inbound outbound cash flows aren't assets and liabilities. Necessarily. Necessarily. Risks and rewards are not. Risks and rewards affect the measurement of an asset or liability, not its existence. Now, obviously, I could look and say, whoo, boy, I'm risk. I've guaranteed these receivables. I got some risk. But then you say, what's my risk represent? Well, the guarantee, that's the liability. Yes. But the, the riskiness and, and the reward possibilities affect measurement, not existence. And we don't know what to do with executory contracts. I'm going to demonstrate that right now. Jack's got a, well, all professors, Wake Forest, I understand. I drove by some of the houses coming from the airport. They all have about $5 million houses. And, I, and I've got an option to buy, or, or forward, either forward or an option, either one, take your pick, to buy Jack's house September 1st for $5 million. Do I have a house? Do I control a house? Mm, better be careful. Does Jack have a house? Does he control a house? Better be careful. Can he sell a house? No. I don't think, however, that I have a house and he fails to have one, but that option forward certainly changes the measurement of that house. He has no more upside potential at all if I have an option. He has no upside or downside potential potential if he has a forward. I have it all. Another reason why risks and rewards don't indicate assets. Uh, again, derecognition, revenue recognition, we think an option or forward. The exact thing, if I once owned Jack's house, sold it to him, had an option or forward to get it back, Revrec would say, you didn't sell it. Derecognition would say, you still have a house. But the economics and the, the, the uh, legal rights are identical, whether I once owned it or not. And we account for it differently. Can writing an option, by definition of li a liability, result in an asset? Think of frequent flyer programs. Are they, are they a liability? Most people say, sure they are. Do you think those, well, I, this is a dumb question. I was going to say, do you think airlines are stupid? I flew, I flew today, so I have some of my doubts. But, but no, they're not stupid. Of course not. Do they think that rewards program brings net inbound cash flow or outbound? What do you think? Inbound. So writing those things, can they get an asset out of that, or is there just a floor on their liability at zero? We haven't resolved that. Can having an option result in a liability? That's the lease example. Can an option or forward create an, a an asset for both parties? I think at forward contracts do. Whether we want to net them, different issue. But even the option. If I write, if I write Seth an option to buy another Porsche, because he's changed girlfriends and the other girlfriend likes, doesn't like the blue one, she wants the red one. So he gets enough. So he's got this valuable option. Because I told Seth, you buy this blue Porsche, you can buy a red one for the next year for the same price. 
In fact, I'll take $1,000 off. Is that an asset for him? Well, he's got a right. But boy, I pray he exercises it. Because if he buys that Porsche at $1,000 less than the first one he bought, I still make $25,000. So I'm tickled to death. That should, does that mean we both have an asset? That's interesting. Um, I'm not going to get into the last one. It'll take me too long to explain. I can't understand it. Measurement. We don't do anything. We really don't. Measurement of assets is controversial, and you know that unless you've been in a parallel universe. Liabilities seem worse, and we seldom really measure anything. What we really do is make calculations. We calculate carrying amounts. How many times does your textbook say record something at its best estimate? Can you give me the characteristics of bestness? What makes one estimate better than another? And we ought to be asking, are we going to record things in an array of possible measures at the mean, the median, or the mode? All right, we don't do that. We just say do the best. Terrific. How many times do you read, record it at the present value of the expected cash flows? And I say, oh, that's a really good idea. Discount it at what rate, 1% or 99%? Because I get quite different answer. And we don't want to address that question. We just had the conference with academics, and I had two beating on me at one session. And I was, you know, meek, and I was taking a beating. And uh, they're telling me that they, why don't we just admit to do everything at present value cash flows? I said, all right, I agree with you. Now let's talk about discount rates. Well, we haven't thought about that. I said, well, then you haven't thought about it. You haven't thought about measurement. Because you've got to know that. Or you've gotten nowhere. Uh, we've got to get better at this. Uh, they demand resolution types of issues we have. We have get very inconsistent answers, risk continuing doing that. It's been an impediment to getting anything done because we keep re-arguing the same issues. And the MOU projects identified because they really were deficient accounting, not just because somebody wanted a to-do list. And we haven't made the progress in getting them done that we should. And both the FSB and the ISB have been working on the framework. We're working on measurement and presentation. and Maybe we'll make some progress. It's essential we do, and I want you to remember this as students in particular. I don't care about the others. You're beyond, you're beyond correction. You can't resolve accounting issues in a consistent manner without using that chart. You've got to do it that way. To defend accounting standard setting, my job, the FASB, I tell both boards, you can't defend what you do if you don't make your decisions based on concept. Would you, could I defend saying, Jack, you record this as a liability? He said, I don't want to. I said, well, I don't like you. I'm a standard setter. I don't like you. I want you to. Or I think you should record it, not anybody else. You can't do it that way. You know, it's, it's like the strike zone in baseball. You can't call Alex Rodriguez out on a 3-2 pitch behind his back because you don't like him or because he's the Yankees, and they win too much. You got to argue about whether the pitch is in the strike zone, which is all the framework does for you. It gives us the argument that we can try and resolve. We cannot possibly, whatever it means, have principle-based standards without a framework, and you will not reduce complexity. A tremendous amount of our accounting complexity in the literature is because of the inconsistent answers, because of asset liability and measurement uncertainty, I would say even that disclosure overload is there if there is such a thing in part because of these. How much of disclosure is there because the accounting's deficient in the first place? Ask yourself that, okay? And alternatives don't work, and this is what you gotta remember. People write letters to the FASB all the time saying, you need to develop a consensus on this. Who, how you can't get a consensus amongst people that want 17 different answers for 15 different reasons. 
there's not going to be a consensus other than maybe cash as an asset or something we could get. There's going to be disagreement. That's why the FASB and ISB are referees. Compromise. Who are you going to compromise with? The Republicans for four years, then the Democrats for four years? Who are we compromising with? Maybe each other in some fashion as decision makers, but not with identifiable constituents. And the most damaging at all is the last one. We get preparer letters all the time that say accounting should have no consequences. And I submit to you that if you agree with that, that accounting shouldn't be consequential, then for God's sakes, change majors. Because you're not going to get paid very much to do inconsequential things. In fact, the more consequential accounting is, the more you do get paid. Accounting's darn consequential in the financial markets. It prices capital, it denies capital, and the more that information we produce is relied on with confidence, the more consequential it is. And it's why you'll get paid more. So you've got to think about making the information the most useful you can make it for resource providers to influence that project process. It's how the market system works, and distorting it is not productive for any of us. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, maybe a couple of questions. Oh, I could have done that easier than you. Hi, Jim. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, you said many provocative things, and you had many uh, excellent ideas and very persuasive arguments. Um, I guess I'm wondering two things that are related. What, um, it seems like you know what to do um, with many of these accounting issues and these. I'm um, positive I do. I th it seems like you do, and, and I trust that you do. I'm wondering what are no, the major. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I think, well, why don't you just get in a room with, you know, Catherine Shipper and Professor Wilkerson and, and solve all these issues and just be done with it. What are the major obstacles for, for you and for the, FASB that you can't seem to, or you haven't been able to get them done, and, uh, and what would you do to change um, the FASB or how things are done in order to s smooth the process going forward? Well, first place, not everyone is going to agree with what I would do. Uh, that's for sure, particularly measurement of financial instruments, for example, they may not. Certainly a couple board members would not. And if I get to pick who goes in the room with me, we could rewrite, we could fix every one of those in three months, all right? But I can't, all right? And by the way, uh, if someone else picked who they could get in the room with, they'd get a quite different set of answers. And a lot of people, that's actually one of the fundamental lessons learned from the convergence effort. I think naively, a good bit of many people thought, well, these are all reasonably bright people. If they sit down and work with each other, we'll just get the same answers. Eh, didn't happen, did it? Quite, quite different answers. And we're influenced by different things. Uh, we're influenced between the United States and the rest of the world because of much different types of capital markets and the like, which just causes some problems. And some of it's frankly a, a word that I've heard that some of the Deloitte people say, is this a problem of skill or will? Probably not skill. Might be for some people. Might be will for some others. But the combination of that. And you can't fight all your fights at once. You really can't. I mean, we learned that. You do have to be judicious in what you take on. The pace of change has to be managed, although saying that we move at a glacial's pace is an insult to a good glacier, because they do move a little bit. Uh, but you know, it, there is something to the fact that there has to be some management of that. And I think we have ebbs and flows of our willingness to do things and all. 
And my, as I said earlier, I think our biggest criticism would be what we have not done with financial instruments in light of the crisis and in light of what's going to be the next crisis. People are going to look back and say, wow, you guys don't learn very fast. And I don't think that's going to be healthy for the process. Not going to be healthy for the process. But I don't know how to make it better other than to keep trying to appoint smart, dedicated people. And hope that we really, well, some of the faculty and I were talking, we've actually had real breakthroughs. The asset and liability definition issues that I talked about, which are the paramount ones, actually, other than set aside measurement. How much of that could you see that my insights that I tried to convey as to what the problematic issues were are steeped in the literature of financial instruments? We didn't recognize that lots of simple contracts contain a lot of optionality or contain a lot of forwardness or contain even swap in some instances. And uh, it's revolutionary to people to think that way. They don't want to think in terms of those receivables as that all you did was write an option. You don't have receivables. And which it's just new. To an, and I think the people that spent a lot of time in financial instruments probably think of things differently than people that have not been there. That's going, to, and that's going to be a long time issue. I, I've, I'm frustrated with some of you out there when you get at the FASB about your financial instrument knowledge, not because of financial instruments, but your knowledge of the economics of options, forwards, and the like, and the consequences it has for measurement and recognition. And I, it's just going to take time to get over that hurdle. So very good question. It's just I don't have a very good answer. OK, thanks. Thank you.